Thank you, Kirk. A big thank you to the young people of this congregation and Shauna, to you also in particular for having started to record our sermons here. I, uh, I was a little bit unaware of how observant, I guess, our conference administration is. They have been watching some sermons and wanted to pass on their thanks to the kids of the church. So thank you young folks that have uh, kind of drug us kicking and screaming into the 21st century. Uh, <clears throat> Melvin took me aside before I left and said, you make sure you continue doing that. Uh, he thinks it's a very important thing to do, keep recording our sermons. I had a good time down there in some ways at the pastor's meetings. It's also a difficult time. Seems like every trip there's there's always bad news in any organization, isn't there? But we've lost some people to the ministry that have gotten discouraged and gone different directions, and that's never easy. Also gained some new people that I think you'll enjoy meeting. The uh, I really appreciated the new pastor to the Korean church in Anchorage. A real, very nice family. I've uh, enjoyed getting to meet them. And, you know, Pastor Lee from down there didn't drop out of the ministry. He moved someplace else. I think he went to New Jersey. <clears throat> Still uh, pastoring a Korean church there. But your Alaska conference, if I counted correctly, is down to 10 pastors. And there's... Uh, there's a handful that work in the office there. Quite a few individuals work in there. We had some good news there. The Arctic Mission uh, fundraising that Tandy leads up, uh, they met their goal. In fact, she surpassed it. They had some matching funds available if she could raise $100,000 between October and December. And uh, she found donors for $130,000, and then the matching donor gave their 100000 so they raised a quarter of a million bucks, basically, in three months there for Arctic missions. And that, I thought, was really exciting. She wants to come spend a Sabbath with us sometime this spring or summer, and I told her she's got an invite whenever she wants to come. Uh, one of these days, Celesta and Zach are going to come down and spend a, a weekend with us. And uh, I asked her to make sure it was not just a pulpit trade because I'd like to be here and spend the weekend with them. They're an enjoyable young couple. I think you'll like, you'll like them. Uh, had some hellos from other people for you, uh, particularly Adrian and, and Ketchikan. He's always interested in how Toke is doing and I think he's one of my closest friends. I just, I love Adrian. He's on fire for the Lord and is, you guys that know him from camp meeting, you know, he says hello. So I'd like to get him to come, but it's a long ways from Ketchikan. I've tried a few times, but uh, maybe someday <clears throat> Adrian could come up for a weekend or something. <clears throat> Uh, they actually fed your pastor better this time. Just thank you, Joanne. There was a lot of vegetables, and I felt just perfectly at home there. But, man, do pastors eat at weird times of the day. 10.30 in the morning? Give me a break, man. I had to eat at the hotel, and then I'd eat again at the conference office. Then they'd eat at 2.30 in the afternoon, and then by, you know, quitting time, I'm hungry again. And... It's like I had five meals a day, I think, for for all week, but uh, managed to survive it anyway. <laughs> what was that? Don't expect it to <clears throat> yeah, I don't expect nothing at all. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> we uh, have been in a long study through the book of Romans. It's picking up pace here a little bit toward the end, and I'm, I'm a little worried that, I don't know if it's burnout on my part with this this study or what's going on, but the application, you know, these last few chapters of Romans, I think, deal with the more practical aspects of it in some ways. The application doesn't lend itself as well to, uh, you know, real deep studies. It's pretty well cut and dried. It tells you what to go and do. 
chapter 13 of Romans has two parts that I'm going to just reference. And then I want us to read together verses 11 through 14. And we're going to go through that passage verse by verse, add some things from other places in the Bible and discuss that a little more in depth. But <clears throat> you can see in this 13th chapter of Romans that Paul is still talking about practical things. We looked last time we were together about, uh, you know, let love be the genuine article, uh, remembering vengeance is Lord's, it's not ours, uh, live like a Christian, I think was the way we concluded the study of chapter 12. Chapter 13 talks about your relationship to government, and Paul says that you know, these powers are not outside of God's concern, that he set them up, that there's good things about government and you're to obey. I think you do couch that in the biblical advice that it's better to obey God uh, than man. If there's conflict between the two, God takes priority, but as far as possible, you're to live at peace with your government, pay your taxes, be honest Christians. And he talks also in this chapter about, again, about loving one another and how that that love is a fulfillment of the law, love that works no ill to the neighbor, to those around you is fulfilling of the law. Practical advice. Now he's going to tell us why these kind of things are so important. And there's two passages, I think, in the rest of the book of Romans that emphasize why living the Christian life is, why it's so critical. I mean, I think you've passed from death to life. I mean, Jesus told us that happens when you come to belief in him. And Paul has talked about how it's not something we can earn, how we've all sinned, fallen short of God's glory, but God sent his son to die for us while we were still his enemies. How accepting that is a... Trans, a transition from death to life in the Christian's life, uh, how he also works in us to change us, but none of, uh, none of the changes that take place in us warrant salvation. It's all still all from Jesus, isn't it? But God needs the people that reflect Jesus, and Paul is going to tell us why after giving us these kind of practical admonitions about obeying the government, loving each other. One of the reasons that you're to obey is that Jesus is soon to come. This is a special time in earth's history, and that's the one we're going to stress today. The second reason that we find in the next chapter is that there is a day of judgment coming where every man's works are brought before the judgment seat, and it matters. Jesus would like to be able to present fruits from this group and say, Heavenly Father, look at this. These people are trying to emulate me. They want to live like, like I have, and you know, here's the proof of it. They're fit citizens for this kingdom. Judgment's coming, Jesus is coming, and Paul emphasizes that, the second coming of Jesus in these last four verses in Romans chapter 13. I went back and looked this week, and you know this is the first time in Romans that Paul has mentioned the second coming of Jesus. Unless I miss something, I... Sometimes I'll read a passage and not, not pick up on what it's referencing. Other times something will jump right out at me. You know how the Bible does that to you? But I did a quick scan back through it, and I don't think Paul has addressed the issue of the second coming of Jesus at all in Romans until this passage. And he has this to say. He says, Knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. He says, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. Make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Knowing the time that the day is at hand, the night is far spent. That's the text that sparked my thinking this week. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. You know, that topic pops up a lot. 
is often uh, addressed in Paul's writings. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 34, he tells us to awake. Again, the same kind of thing uh, alluded to. He says, awake to righteousness. He says, sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 4 through 11, he tells us and assures us that we're not a people that are in darkness. He says it this way, that's 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 4. He said, brethren, you're not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. He said, you're children of the light and the children of the day he said we're not of the night nor of the darkness therefore let us not sleep as do others but let us watch and be sober he says for they that sleep sleep in the night they that be drunken are drunken in the night but let us who are of the day be sober putting on the breastplate of faith and love and for an helmet the hope of salvation for god hath not appointed us to wrath but to obtain salvation by our lord that text is super interesting to me. He said, you're children of the light and children of the day. Don't sleep. I almost hear a reference in that that says you can be a child of the light and be sleeping in the daytime. And I think that may be the case for just a whole lot of those that should be eagerly awaiting the second coming of the Lord Jesus. I want you to think with me just a little bit about the day and age we live in. I shared a little bit of a story with the kids in Sabbath school. I saw something in the Anchorage airport that just twisted me up. You know, I've watched an old guy about my age, perverted old guy, sneaking his phone around to try to get pictures down some young lady's blouse. And I was sitting next to him. I thought, what in the world? You know, I mean, how debased the people got to get and then she came and sat next to me on the airplane and I thought Lord trying to tell me something I had a nice conversation with her I said did you notice what that guy you were sitting next to in the terminal was up to and she hadn't noticed and she thanked me for being interested in her well-being and we had a nice nice chat I'm kind of hoping to get to see her again someday she's about she'd been to Anchorage to have some pictures taken of her baby she was pregnant and she's diabetic and had to, you know I guess diabetics have high risk pregnancies and you have to go to Anchorage for that ah uh, but just blatant evil every place you look our world is is hurting isn't it and that's one of the things you know when I go away to these pastors meetings sometimes I come home discouraged almost because of all the nonsense that a church organization has to go through because of the perversity of the culture that we live in. The extreme caution you have to take in everything you do anymore. You know, two weeks ago, a fire drill is one thing. When did you have to start having active shooter drills in a church? You know, we live in a, a day and age where everything points to the fact that Jesus is coming again. And you, as children of the light, ought to be excited about that. I should be excited about it. But I think we've, we're napping sometimes. We're about half asleep. And Paul says, don't sleep as do others. He said, wake up. That text in 1 Corinthians is wake up to righteousness. You know, he's... Don't wake up with a sense of dread because the world has gone to hell in a handbasket. You know, you're a child of the light. Relish it. You should be excited as we see the day approaching, shouldn't we? Romans chapter 13, verse 11. The night is far spent. It's as black right now as it's likely to get. It wouldn't have to get any more evil for Jesus to come again, would it? Sodom and Gomorrah, he's going to have to apologize to him if he doesn't come soon. It's a strange day we live in. The night is far spent, but the day is at hand. Awake out of sleep, for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. And thinking about that text, you know, you start thinking about signs of the second coming of Jesus. And one of the first places most of you would go would be Matthew 24, isn't it? Uh, 
That discourse Jesus gave to his disciples after they had asked for what sign are we to look for for the end. And they associated the end with the fall of Jerusalem. In their mind, Jesus gave them a list of signs. We don't have time in this sermon's not to go over all of those, but you know most of them. You know, false Christ, nations rising against nation, pestilences. Ah, pestilences. That's in the news this week. You know, earthquakes, volcanoes, you name it. It's all in the news. But there's one in that passage particularly concerns me. Verse 12. Matthew chapter 24. Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. That's a sign of the end that I don't want to see happen to anybody here. Focus on the righteousness. Awake to that, like Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15. If you awake to anything, awake to a realization of what a blessed Savior we have. Don't have your focus on the difficulties in this world. Don't have your focus on the fact that even within the church, things are not as they should be and they aren't. The church is in desperate condition. We really are. The Bible predicted that. He said, you're laying this in to the max, Jesus said. You got issues. You're blind. You're poor. You're naked. You're not half as righteous as you think you are. You know, it's evil exists within God's body, within the church. It won't stay there forever. You know, he has a way to take care of that. But your focus, yours and mine, should be, oh, we should be awaking to righteousness to the glory that we see in Jesus Christ, to the work he can do in our heart in the Holy Spirit. When wickedness abounds, don't let your love grow cold. Don't focus on the others around you. Maybe, maybe somebody in our own congregation will kick over the traces and do something just wicked and stupid. You know, people aren't immune to that. But don't let it make your love grow cold. When iniquity abounds, cling closer to Jesus. Don't let your love wax cold because he says, if you endure to the end, you'll be saved. You'll be saved. He that endures to the end shall be saved. We're not doing very good. We've got through one text, one verse. We've got three more. So... Uh, we won't spend... We won't spend as long on them. That's verse 11, more or less. To your salvation is nearer than when you first believed. You know, I, I used to read that text just before we pass on. But I used to read that text and say, that's a, that's a no-brainer, Paul. You know, time is linear, isn't it? Everything's closer than it was a moment ago. Uh, but do you sense it? Do you feel an urgency? Do you sense that it's for real? That Jesus is coming again soon? I think that's what Paul's referencing. He's to pay attention. Pay attention. It's happening. Jesus is coming again. Verse 12, last part of it. Cast off the works of darkness. Put on the armor of light. Cast off the works of darkness. Put on the armor of light. I wrote down Philippians 4, verses 4 through 6 next to that. And uh, I don't remember why now, but I see now that I look at Philippians 4, verses 4 through 6. That starts out with rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. That's a text about focus. And he says, let your moderation, your New King James Bible, I think is going to say gentleness there, be known unto all men, the Lord is at hand. Then be careful for nothing. And your New King James again there says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be known to God. Be anxious for nothing. Rejoice in the Lord. Let your gentleness be known to all men. And the peace of God, which passes understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ.
put on the armor of light, cast off the works of darkness. Don't stress out about it. Folk on Jesus, walk honestly as in the day, verse 13, not in rioting, drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. Make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Couple, <clears throat> couple texts that we want to look at about putting on the Lord Jesus Christ tie right in with verse 12 on the armor of light. Where would you go to if you wanted to talk about the Christian's armor? Ephesians chapter 6, yeah. Ephesians chapter 6 starts in verse 11 with put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand to be among those that endure to the end to be somebody whose love hasn't waxed cold that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil we're told we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities against powers against the rulers of darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places I'd like to pause on that text just a little bit if I could. Who's the war against? Yeah. What does Satan use as a tool? Deception. Satan uses deception, but he uses people. Satan trips up congregations. He trips up individuals with people that fall under his influence for either extended periods of time or just for briefly. How many people have you met in your Christian experience, maybe even as a Seventh-day Adventist, that are no longer here with us because they got tripped up by looking at an individual, not at Jesus? You know? Has Satan ever used you? you know, I know he's used me. We misspeak sometimes. We, we say hurtful things to each other that we shouldn't. And it behooves us when we become aware of that to apologize for it and you know, attempt through the power of the Lord Jesus Christ not to make those kind of mistakes again. But it's also incredibly important for us to remember where our focus is supposed to be and what the war is about. When somebody does something hurtful to you, if you can remember that that actually came from our arch enemy, Satan, it probably was not even intentional on the individual's part. I mean, you know, we don't know what kind of day they were having. Uh, Maybe it's just somebody that's a negative influence in your life, can't ever think of nothing good happening, that can drag you down. That's just, that's just Satan trying to get at you through an individual. Look back to Jesus and forget that. Because, and maybe pray for him, maybe they'll get over it. You know, you wrestle not against flesh and blood, it's against principalities and powers, rulers of darkness. Take unto you the whole armor of God that you can withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. It says, stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Take the shield of faith above all, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Take the helmet of salvation, and finally, an offensive tool, one that can stick it to the devil. Take the sword of what? Don't try it on your own. Don't try it on your own. Take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication. Put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. Make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. You are to make some provisions for something else. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 16. Yeah, you know, it tells us we're not to walk as the rest of the world does, but walk in the Spirit and you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Walk in the Spirit. Make no provisions for the flesh. 
Put on the armor of God. Persevere to the end. Jesus, my friends, is coming soon. Keep your focus on that happy thought. The night's far spent, the day's at hand. Wake up. Jesus is coming again. I think the plan today is to have lunch here. Right? Sean and Anthony would like us to come to their house. Is to that come to their house. Everybody? That works for me just as good, maybe even better. So let's uh, go to Anthony and Shauna's for lunch today. Have potluck there. And I'm Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that Jesus is coming again. It, it seemed to me like today, even in Sabbath school time, that was an emphasis. The nearness of the second coming of Jesus. And we look around our world and we say, Lord, it is time. We're, we know there's a work to be accomplished, but we also know you're a great big God and that those kind of things can happen in a mighty big hurry. I thank you for that. There's so much hurt, so much evil in our world, and we just look forward to the day when it's all over, when uh, your people can be at home with you. Help us to be part of that group. And we realize that as children of the light, we've gotten kind of sleepy and sometimes are caught taking naps. We ask that not be the case for us, that we awake to righteousness, that we awake to the time we live in and be living in expectation of that day. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat>